Cool. <coughs> you guys staying on this camera or you come? Oh, you're panning it. Cool. All right, here we go. Three, two, one. What a Thanksgiving surprise. Coach Lavin is here. Steve Lavin from Fox Sports. Coach, glad that you're in New York City. Happy holidays. Great to be with you. Happy holidays to you. Thanksgiving traditions for you? Getting together with family and a lot of turkey, mashed potatoes, pumpkin pie, a little scoop of vanilla ice cream as well. I always think of tournaments at this time of the year, the non-conference, you know, basketball tournaments, and being with your teams, you know, at Purdue and UCLA and St. John's, a special time because often there isn't the window for your players to get home or for the coaches to get home. And so celebrating Thanksgiving uh, as a basketball program was always a special day. What's this week like? It's still fairly early in the season for teams. How do you get your team ready for game after game after game? Well, I do think one of the challenges during the holidays and around the academic calendar and kids looking ahead to wanting to get home for Christmas, uh, you can have those banana peel games where you slip and maybe get upset uh, by a mid-major uh, opponent that's coming in razor sharp and eager and locked in on point. And so, um, you know, having your teams mindful of how difficult it is to win and to concentrate on the task at hand during the holidays and around uh, the rigors of an academic schedule that uh, players come with. You were at the Gavit tip-off games last week, a couple of them doing remotes for Fox Sports. Those atmospheres and those games, the opening week of the schedule, what do they bring to the table? Well, it's a good question. You know, number one is when you play quality competition early in the season, you get that report card. And as a staff, uh, you go back and watch tape, and then you cut that tape up and you watch it with your team. And uh, win or lose, you have a better gauge of where you are in preparation for the league and ultimately for the postseason. And you're able to amplify certain aspects uh, that need to be addressed, certain vulnerabilities, and you still have the time to get on the practice floor, do the drill work, create better basketball habits, and put together a better team moving forward. So I'd rather play a tough schedule in the non-conference and have a sense of where your team truly is Get a gauge um, in preparation for conference play where you know it's going to be very challenging. Instead of loading up with cupcakes and getting an inflated sense of self, an exaggerated uh, view of your, your team's strengths and not having those areas, those weaknesses that need to be exposed and addressed. You're making me really hungry <laughs> because you brought up the Thanksgiving meal. Banana peels have been in on here. True. Cupcakes as well. And does mom cook for Thanksgiving? <laughs> like, did, did she cook growing up? Well, back in the day, it was a team effort, but mom was clearly the leader. Uh, six children in an Irish Catholic family, and oftentimes kids from the neighborhood, cousins as well, uh, would come over. And so uh, we were fortunate uh, to have some great Thanksgiving dinners together uh, as a family. As you get older, you know, because of coaching, and whatnot, I wasn't able to get home at Thanksgiving uh, as often as I would have preferred. Let's turn to the Big East. What has stood out to you the most through a couple weeks of the season? One is Xavier. You know, seeing them up close and in person in that win against the Badgers uh, at the Kohl Center, uh, they were razor sharp, uh, mm -hmm. came in with a purpose, executed well. Obviously, Trayvon blew it. Not only a Big East Player of the Year candidate, but I think a national. Player of the Year candidate, uh, his ability once again to step up in the second half and take the game over, make big shots as a crunch time performer, um, was really impressive. And of course, Mikura always brings that hard edge, uh, the chippy element or aspect. And you know, if he's on your team, you love him. If he's an <laughs> opponent, you can't stand him. Um, but a lot of respect for the intelligence that Mercura plays the game with and how he's able to influence the game in a number of ways at both ends of the floor. Playmaking, rebounding, uh, getting steals, uh, the ability to make timely three-pointers, creating off-the-bounce uh, 
sharing the ball to his, you know, to his teammates. And I think Mercura is a extension of Coach Mack on the floor. You know, he kind of is emblematic or embodies uh, the spirit of Chris Mack, and it's why those two are so close in terms of a player-coach relationship. You think Mack, when he was a player, had some Mercura in him? I think there's a mutual respect for one another, and they both are all business and highly competitive and very intelligent in their approach. Uh, Coach Mack is a as a sideline orchestrator, and Mikura on the floor uh, being the leader of that team. Uh, so there is a like-mindedness uh, that I think Mack and Mikura save uh, or uh, share. Uh, Eminem, I just thought of that. Mack and Mikura could be a branding opportunity, something for you to think about. You bring, you bring it all on the table. I try to, especially for you. You bring out my best. I try, Coach. Did you always want to be a coach? Because you got entrepreneur in you. At a young age, I, you know, being around, I think, my older brothers, you know, who played basketball, and my father, who was an educator, and my father was an outstanding player at St. Ignatius High School in San Francisco, Northern California. Well, I'm a St. Ignatius grad in Cleveland. Are you? The Jesuits. Jesuits. As good as it gets. They got money. Right? Thomas Aquinas and <laughs> existential philosophy and Socrates and Plato and okay. Aristotle. Um, outstanding teachers. Uh, when you the look at the Jesuits. So training, very rigorous as well, almost the Green Berets in the spiritual dimension or the Navy SEALs when you look at the, the Jesuits in terms of uh, the discipline, right? The I couldn't handle that. <laughs> Christian manhood for 40 minutes a day was enough for me. <laughs> right, exactly. Uh, earning your stripes. Earn your stripes, yeah. yeah. Making so, your bed. Yep, yeah. the basics, fundamentals, kind of like freshman fundamentals in the Big East, right? The ABCs, <laughs> the one, two, threes of uh, sport, but also life and uh, the keys to achievement. But um, So I'd say my father, as, as a teacher and educator, he was English literature, philosophy, and poetry, and a writer, an author of 17 books on writing and composition. Wow. Taught at Cal Berkeley in San Francisco State, uh, College of Marin, Reardon High School in San Francisco, Drake High School in Marin. Uh, so he was a lifelong educator. So I think his love of basketball and his love of literature and ideas uh, was a, a big influence on me. And so wanting to teach and having a love of basketball, coaching was a natural outgrowth, uh, I think because of wanting to emulate my father and the example he set. And I've been fortunate for 30 years now to be associated with the game in, in some form or fashion as an assistant, a head coach, a broadcaster, but associated with this level of basketball. So very grateful in the spirit of Thanksgiving to be here with you talking basketball and hopefully sharing some turkey and mashed potatoes after this interview. Absolutely. It's, it's in the kitchen. They should have brought it out for us already. I would have gotten started. Who are those players that come to mind? You talk about your 30 years, the, your favorite players. You know, as an assistant at Purdue, uh, Steve Scheffler comes to mind, Big Ten Player of the Year in 1990 and uh, led us to a very special kind of rewarding season. I really enjoyed my time working under Coach Katie in the Big Ten Conference. And it really was the golden years in my view. At that time, Bill Frieder was at Michigan, Bobby Knight at Indiana, Judd Heathcote at Michigan State, Bill Foster, an outstanding coach who prior was at Duke and was at Northwestern wow. when I was in the uh, Big Ten as an assistant coach, Clem Haskins in Minnesota, Dr. Tom Davis at Iowa. Uh, just outstanding coaches uh, up and down the Big Ten and being able to observe observe uh, as an apprentice those coaches work was uh, a great experience. At UCLA as an assistant, uh, Gerald Matkins, uh, Ed O'Bannon, Tyus Edney come to mind as a head coach at UCLA, uh, Cameron Dollar, Earl Watson um, are a few of the names that, that really jump out. It's difficult because you love all your kids. Right. Uh, there are some naturally you have a close relationship with than others. Uh, certain teams that you you feel a better a, more of a bond with than other teams, but you love them all. You still do with St. John's from time to time, D'Angelo and others. Oh, D'Angelo, Phil Green, Don Pointer, uh, Jamal Branch. What made that senior class so special is we were able to go out in my final season with an NCAA tournament, and all all of our seniors earned their degree as well. So uh, even our walk-on Kadeem earned his scholarship um, and, and and earned his degree. So. It's a, uh, it's a great profession, very rewarding, uh, very challenging, and 
And in this day and age, uh, there's a minefield, a myriad of, of uh, new challenges that probably didn't exist in coaching 20 or 30 years ago. There's two new coaches in the Big East, Patrick Ewing. He knows Madison Square Garden. Laval Jordan also has coached inside there before. But how exactly do you go about that journey in March, the Big East tournament, in Madison Square Garden? Well, first off, it's such an honor to be in the Big East tournament. The energy in New York City that week is palpable. Even in the weeks building up to the Big East tournament, uh, you can feel the momentum and the anticipation of you know, college basketball being played in Madison Square Garden because New Yorkers love their basketball. Uh, if you go back the history of the old garden and the history of this conference and the history of basketball in New York City uh, is really special, elite. And so as a coach, it's about trying to win games, uh, but also really enjoying the moment mm -hmm. and not taking it for granted yeah. and, and being grateful that you get to participate uh, in such a special event that's got such great history. And uh, all the coaches and players, officials, right, that blazed the trail before us uh, that allowed us to now enjoy it. A lot of big time performers through the years of Madison Square Garden. Do you have a favorite concert that you've ever seen in general? Favorite performer? Tony Bennett on his 80th birthday in Southern California. Actually went with my mother and father who had a great appreciation. My grandpa uh, loves him. Bennett. How do you go wrong? And that song and the, the lyrics, that old refrain, I left my heart in San Francisco, which is my hometown. So born and raised. Uh, so it has, you know, special sentiment. And uh, it was Tony Bennett and his daughter that were performing together, which made it special as well because the father and daughter's relationship. And for me, because my parents who were getting up there in age and kind of in the home stretch of their life. So to be able to share that night was uh, probably the most memorable concert. There were some like the Rolling Stones at AT&T Park where I attended with some rowdy friends of mine. Uh, but that's different uh, <laughs> type of evening, obviously, and festivities than There's you know, an appreciation with, with Bennett. <laughs> Absolutely. Because you, you show up and you really take the performance in. Sure. Mick the Jagger, Stones. Mick Jagger, I took it in too. I was, I was in awe of his vitality, his energy, and uh, the, the, we talk about Xavier and, you know, their strength and conditioning coach and their kind of, you know, physicality, but uh, what I took away from the Stones concert was not only all the classics, the oldies, but the goodies, and then rocking that stadium, but it was the stamina yeah. of Mick Jagger. I mean, It's almost wow. like J.P. Makura could be the son of Mick Jagger. True. I like that. Yeah, they kind of have that wiry, angular... Uh, build, uh, yeah. kind of raw, raw boned. Yeah, that would be I a like Thanksgiving that. table. I, I like that. Yeah. There would be no leftovers. How about the uh, loose ball drill with those two, Mick Jagger oh. and Mikura, trying to go after a loose ball drill or war rebound drill? I think Mikura would have the edge over Mick Jagger just because of the length, the size. But uh, <laughs> but Mick's energy and quick feet. Who knows? Should have brought yeah. in Mick Jagger on Skype here. <laughs> we should have his next opinion. time. What's next he doing time. right now? Good question. Probably somewhere. Globe trotting, uh, having a hell of a time for himself in another time zone. <laughs> Coach Raft, you saw him last week. How does he go from, he was in Maryland one night, next night he's flying over to Wisconsin at his age. I mean, and, and I know he would joke and say, John, relax, but Coach, he's everywhere. He's bionic. He is the bionic, bionic broadcaster. There was the $6 million man, right? There's the bionic woman. He is the bionic broadcaster. And the fact that he performs like Tony Bennett, you know, night after night, uh, Johnny Carson comes to mind, this right? Is, you're just, Through the decades. You're writing the script for a Fox Christmas special. There it is. But uh, I really have so much respect and admiration of knowing Coach Raftery now for 30 years. When I was an assistant at Purdue, he mm -hmm. would come in and call Big Ten games on occasion. When I was an assistant at UCLA, you know, he covered the Bruins when I was a head coach at UCLA. He had a number of our NCAA tournament runs. And then, of course, locally at St. John's, um, we were able to have Coach Raff call some of our games. And he spoke at one of our tip-off banquets, as he did again this year uh, for St. John's. So a class, gentleman, uh, strong intellect, uh, 
informative, and yet there is a lightheartedness. Yes. Um, never gets too grim or serious uh, about a sport, about a game. I think he keeps that alive in his broadcast, and I think that's important to remember that it is a game. In a conference that's as deep as the Big East is once again, how does Villanova go about repeating? Well, I think they go about their business in such a consistent, you know, deliberate manner. Even the way they win games, they kind of dismantle opponents in a methodical way uh, through great defense, which creates their runouts on offense. If they don't have the numbers in transition, uh, they make opponents guard because they get deeper into the clock. Uh, they take often you know, less field goal attempts, both in games and on the season, than their opponents. But because they make those shots count, uh, they shoot a higher percentage, they draw more fouls, they get to the free throw line, they put teams uh, in foul jeopardy in terms of better players and foul trouble on the bench. Uh, and uh, they, they play defense with discipline. They don't foul themselves. Yeah. Uh, and yet they're very aggressive. But there's defensive discipline, not reaching, not lunging, not gambling. And as a result, they win that free throw game on a consistent basis, which is one of the keys to their success as well. So I think they have a blueprint for success, similar to what the Patriots have in football. Uh, we're great baseball teams. Look at the San Francisco Giants and their run over the years, right? Pitching and defense and timely hitting. Really, Villanova is similar. Uh, good defense timely three-point shooting, and uh, a cohesive yeah. approach at both ends of the floor. Five seconds on the clock. Who in the Big East is taking that final shot for you to beat the buzzer? Marcus Foster would be at the top of the list, uh, but right behind Brunson in his ability to create either for himself or a teammate or to draw a foul because he's so moxie, has great savvy, and uh, navigates or maneuvers off the bounce as well as anybody in the league. He doesn't do it with blazing speed. Brunson is an interesting study because it's his footwork, it's his craftiness, it's the head and shoulder fakes, and sometimes it's keeping the dribble alive, sometimes it's jump stopping and probing and searching and looking a one count or a two count behind, not panicking and dropping off a great pocket pass or fanning the ball back out to a teammate that's maybe sliding the corner for the three ball. Uh, so Brunson is, is impressive. And then Trayvon Blewett. I'd say those three those right three. now. But it's such a good league. You could go down the list. St. John's with their guards, Shamori Pons and Marcus Levette uh, are outstanding. But I'd say right now, uh, Blewett and Foster and Brunson. Any team or player that stands out to you about defending that shot? Mm, good question. You know, there's players with versatility, um, like Kyrie Thomas, because he has the length, he can guard multiple positions. Uh, but I'd say the collective approach of Villanova yeah. defensively is what makes them effective. They don't necessarily have one player that's a glove defensively, like a Gary Payton or that shutdown defender, but as a group, as a unit, the way they move tied together uh, make them you know, very tough to score upon. And because they take great shots and they don't turn the ball over, uh, you rarely get a run out on Villanova. They're right. always back setting their defense, partly because the good shots not turn it over and the ball's going through the net after a free throw or field goal. So you've got to inbound it, which allows the defense to get back and set or a three-quarter court press, uh, which they do often. Um, but I'd say it's the teams like Villanova and Xavier uh, that, Those teams. that really lock teams up in a collective manner. Fittingly at the top of the conference. Exactly. And different ways because you look at Xavier, they play more zone than Villanova does. Zone will, Villanova will sprinkle in some zone, but there are games where if Xavier's having success in a zone, they, they won't get out of it. They'll stay with it, whether it's playing that 1-3-1 one, one aggressively uh, or you know starting out in that half-court 1-3-1 one, one, and then dropping back in and collapsing uh, like an accordion, they can play it tight around the basket area or they can extend and really contest, get into passing lanes. So uh, Chris Mack has a good feel. There are a number of coaches in this league that have outstanding feel for the game and their personnel and how to make adjustments within the game and from game to game and from year to year 
the flexibility in their approach or thinking to put their players in a position to be successful. Did you play an instrument growing up? You brought up the accordion. I didn't. You know, I would poke a little bit at the piano. I could do the Mission Impossible theme song, kind of just poking at it, you know. Do, 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 yeah. do, 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 do. You ever do any but, stunts to that? or? Completely? You know, as a kid, there were a lot of stunts in the neighborhood, and there were four boys, six children o overall. I was the youngest of six, so yeah. uh, we were hellions. There's no doubt. I, I'm amazed that my mother and father, you know, lived as long as as they did uh, because uh, we could wear out, you know, teachers, babysitters, as well as our parents. What was your best subject at school? It became English uh, over time. So that was what I was most interested in, but I think some of that had to do with my mother and father. They were really interested in education and in ideas, and they liked to read books. My mother was art history. She. Her area of expertise was Edward Hopper, mm. um, famous painter. And you've been my, talking about authors so much in English. Did you have a favorite author mm, that you just love to read? There were books that actually interested me. Uh, my dad started me out on the comics, like Marvel comics. I like those too. Then I graduated. You know, naturally Peter Rabbit, James the Giant Peach. <laughs> uh, but was it Raoul Dahl? I think James yes. the Giant Peach. Is it Roald, is yeah. it Roald Dahl or uh, Roald Dahl? Something along Matilda. those lines, yeah. I was a big fan of that. Charlotte's Web. Yeah, uh, Charlotte's was, Web was is excellent. One. Old Yeller, Where the Red Fern Grows, were kind of heartbreaking. First time you kind of deal with uh, mortality and, and uh, Heart, I loved uh, Mice and Men Ooh, by good one. John Steinbeck from the back. Yeah, that up. Old Man of the Sea as well, right? Didn't yeah, Steinbeck? I didn't read that one. Mm. That one was very deliberate tempo. Uh, the pace wouldn't go over very well today in this bombardment of electronics and special effects and whatnot. Right. Uh, the Natural by Bernard Malamud, not the movie, but the book. The movie's great, too. Yeah. With the lights. Walden Pond was, was another kind of, you know, breakthrough book in high school. Uh, Thoreau is as good as it gets. And you have to reread Walden Pond. It's one that, you know, every five years you pick it up and reread it. And the text hasn't changed. But because we've changed through life experience, we bring more to the text, more to the book. Uh, it's funny now, text has a different meaning than text back in the day, which was the it does. word. It does. Now you're all clarify. over the place. You're very savvy texting. People know about you <laughs> tweeting. You have apps and all kinds of things. You know, I've really tried in this new millennial. You get left behind. Uh, you're kind of, you know, a dinosaur yeah. uh, if, if you don't keep up to some degree. That's one of the positive aspects, one of many positive aspects of coaching is, you know, we keep getting older, but the players we recruit and the players we coach are the same age, 16 to 22 years, two years old. So they help bridge that gap and help kind of inform a more relevant uh, kind of perspective. And uh, players like to tease me because obviously they think I'm an old fuddy-duddy. Uh, you're not. Head, but, uh, <laughs> and, and that brings up my next question, and I have to be honest with you because uh, we're friends here, and would you want to coach again? If it was the right fit, I would consider a return to coaching. I mean, uh, that is the passion, and it's something I've done at multiple stops, and I was fortunate in this kind of magic carpet ride of basketball to work under great teachers oh my gosh, at Purdue, great brands. UCLA, and St. John's. So to leave television, though, it has to be a good marriage, a good fit, a place where I know we can win and be successful, a place that has the resources to be successful, and that's what St. John's had. I was at ESPN seven years, and uh, unless a good fit like St. John's came along, I would have stayed in television. Uh, but the Big East and New York City mm. and the story, tradition, and history and the opportunity to, to live in New York City, uh, and I knew we could be successful, and, and we were. Um, so something along the lines of a St. John's, but it doesn't have to be big. It's more about the fit. Right. And there were a lot of people when St. John's Open that weren't interested. It got turned down by a number of coaches because they hadn't had success in 10 to 12 years. And once you start having success and going to NITs and NCAAs and postseasons and recruiting kids to get drafted again, then the brand, you know, is, is raised and amplified. And now it becomes an attractive program that coaches want to be at, but that wasn't the case back in 2010. 
Um, so, you know, I think a program where I know I can add value to be a good fit, we could be successful, uh, I would consider the return. But if those elements aren't in play, uh, following my mentors like Bill Rafferty, yeah. uh, you know, and, and, and broadcasting the next 30 years is pretty appealing. I thought from a coach's perspective, do you know this time of year what kind of team you're going to have in March? Absolutely. There are aspects that you know are still fluid that need tweaking. You know, you're always molding and always trying to find, you know, fresh and original ways, uh, better teaching methods to bring forth the potential of individuals as well as your team. So, you uh, so know that if, process never ends, but you have a good feel, the pulse, just like a parent does with their children, uh, like a, you know, a, a trainer, a jockey, yeah. right, with the horses. Um, you, you know, there's naturally unforeseen aspects. Mm -hmm. uh, there's twists and turns. There's injuries. Uh, yeah. there, you know, chemistry. Uh, it's it's, you know, so tenuous and fragile. I always use the alchemist or a scientist with the test tubes as right. you try and build. A team, but uh, it's almost like Xavier last year. The body got damaged, but that body in March was still there mm -hmm. at the end of the day after all they went through. Well, that's a really interesting point that you bring up, Xavier, because I also believe there are examples of teams, and Xavier is one of them, that through trials and tribulations, through injuries, through suspensions, that out of necessity, different dimensions of a team come forward. In other words, you might have to play more zone. You change your rotation. A player that was the 10th man suddenly is the 6th man, and he blossoms and becomes a star. And we saw all those pieces in play with Xavier in that NCAA tournament run, uh, where out of necessity, uh, with a shorter bench and a different set of players that they began the season with, a different rotation, uh, they caught fire. And then it became an advantage because opponents weren't prepared. There wasn't a body of work that this group had to analyze right. or to watch film on because it all happened so fast. And now I think you're seeing Xavier take that Elite Eight run and they've picked up where they left off with confidence because they know uh, what it takes through that experience that they had last year. And also you appreciate how fragile it all is. When you lose six out of seven, games in a season as they did down the stretch yeah. and then you also go on that run in the NCAA tournament those extremes right humbles you absolutely and it's like comparative literature you know you compare the two and now you pull out the distinctions and you know the difference on what really matters it's like white meat versus dark meat <laughs> there you go Ebony are you white or, are you white or dark this week or? I like white meat yeah yeah I'm gravy you know and I think part of it's because my dad had triple bypass quadruple bypass we were kind of you know, a family after that happened to my father that we had to, you know, go to the skim milk and a more low-fat diet, and my mom was obviously overseeing, you know, uh, oatmeal. I might have to get of, into her instead program. Of tricks or you still admit people into your... <laughs> I need the program, too. We're going to do it together. My grandpa still <laughs> eats the turkey gizzard. Nice. Wow, he's all in. 85 years old. He's all in. He will be eating yeah. it on Thursday, yeah. be, feasting on it. That's one of those, just be committed, right? Have that's, conviction. That's one you love because nobody's fighting you for it. <laughs> True. Like, yeah, knock yourself out. Yeah. A little like escargot or something, right? Right. At a fancy restaurant. You're like, wow, right. interesting. Before you go, if there were a movie about you, who would play you? Who would be the actor? Who would you want to be? Boy, that's a good question. I mean, my old school would be Bogart just because my parents raised us on 1940s and Bogart. You know, 50s films. Bogart or Gene Kelly. Yep. And those are extremes, but those were two you know, actors that were in movies that as a kid our parents would bring us to in terms of like film festivals and revivals in San Francisco sure. uh, or when they came on TV, like a Turner classic scenario. And then I guess in this era, wow, Clive Owen, I, I think he's interesting character in terms of uh, the depth and authenticity that he brings to his performances. A young Robert Duvall, I wouldn't mind that. Mm -hmm. You know, see, I think I'd gravitate more towards like that. the type of actors. I love Duvall's authenticity. I think he's a little bit underrated. We all, you know, Paul Newman, Robert Redford, you know, there's the more glamour leading men in films, yeah. but I think Robert Duvall is like that 
all just, time. Gravitas, range in his abilities. Robert Mitchum is another one. I get a kick out of him. He reminds me of Bobby Huggins. I think Bob Huggins in college basketball is the Robert Mitchum. I just heard from the back, Ray Liotta. <laughs> wow. Now he's... Ray Liotta? Ray Liotta is more that he kind of scares you, <laughs> you know, and that's... <laughs> That's a compliment to him that he can play that kind of different field away. Mickey Rourke yeah. has that too. I'd put yeah. Leota and Mickey Rourke different, but they'd be in that same subgroup of who. I just thought yikes. of it randomly. I think that Bill Raftery could be in a movie about Bob Barker. That's a good call. Could you see Raft walking down and Raft know, could have highest bidder? He could Price he, is Right remake. Raft can do anything. I think he could be a song and dance. Uh, he could be could go camping in a California. leading man. He could be a diplomat. You know, I could see him as an ambassador, you know, to bartender. some other country. Bartender as well. He's got those skills. Uh, I marvel. Great father, great husband, sense of humor. He's had a full life. And uh, that's what I really enjoy about him. My parents loved Bill Rafferty. They were a great judge of character. They'd always say, you know, I like that guy, Bill Rafferty. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he had that Irish charm too, great storyteller. And I think that all comes across in a natural way in his broadcast, without forcing or trying too hard. It's just natural. All right, well, you're a great storyteller, so we'll oh, leave with this you. here. Whether it's Thanksgiving or Christmas, do you have a story you look back on when you were coaching or maybe growing up, a holiday story for us all? You know, not one specific story, although I will say the greatest gift and Christmas that I remember was my father bought the entire family Wilson Jet leather basketballs. And wow. my parents didn't have a lot of dough because they were educators and six kids. And my dad was an author, but you know, that's a tough industry right. uh, selling books, especially educational books on composition or writing. Uh, he did edit a book on jazz and edit a book <coughs> called Action, which was an anthology of the best sports writers with Sports Illustrated pictures combined. Versatile. Very versatile, yep. And it was used in grammar school, high school, college, and graduate levels, a way to inspire kids if they're reading a profile on a Willie Mays or Hank Aaron or yeah. Lou Alcindor in, in a day. So he got uh, you Arthur basketballs. Well, the entire family, six Wilson leather jet basketballs. Did you just start remember, right away? Talk about James the Giant Peach, right? You see, open that up and the world that exponentially grows and the possibilities through that basketball. And he really probably set an entire life or career in a certain path or trajectory because, and we didn't need anything else, that was it. Six basketballs for six kids because the girls played too. And it was the greatest Christmas ever. And you've been running the floor ever since. I like that, good metaphor. This was a slam dunk. Coach Lavin, this. catch him on FS1 and Fox all season long. One of the kings of Big East hoops. Coach, thanks so much. Enjoyed it. Thanks for having Happy me on. Happy Thanksgiving. You too.